in seeking not only to study and criticize the social world and the responses to it proposed by others, the version of anthropology I advocate for strives to collaboratively, <laughs> responsibly, and ethically intervene in the world. These words are from our next speaker, Sara Pink. Sara Pink is currently still part of RMIT University in Australia. She is about to take over a new position she will tell us about. And her outstanding scope of research focuses on emerging technologies, automated futures, and design for well-being. Please, Sara, welcome on stage. Woo. Thank you very much. Um, absolutely delighted to be here. I've followed the um, Why the World Needs Anthropologists conference for ever since it, it first was held. And um, this is the first time I've been able to come to the conference. It's, um, it's been a wonderful start, and I'm looking forward to the rest of today and tomorrow. So, um, as Veronica said, my, um, my talk um, is focusing on, on an interventional design anthropology of emerging technologies. I'll say a little bit about the well, I'll tell you about the title first. Um, the first part of the title is called Why Will My Self-Driving Car Kill Me? And I'm not about to tell you that we, we need anthropologists um, because self-driving cars are going to kill us. I'm actually going to tell you that we need an interventional design anthropology of emerging technologies because that question is even being asked at all. Those kinds of questions are being asked because the world's a bit of a mess. And many visions of dystopian futures and anthropologists actually have a role to play in thinking through futures and thinking through responsible and ethical futures. Now, the other part of my title about um, emerging technologies is that I'm just about, on the 1st of November, to start a new position at Monash University in Australia, where I'll be, I'll be a professor of design in emerging technologies, and I'll be setting up an emerging technologies lab, which will precisely be advocating for and doing um, with connections with partners from all over the world in all kinds of areas the kind of research I want to talk about today. So I think we need anthropologists in the world. I think the world needs anthropologists. And particularly, we need anthropologists in a world that's facing a whole range of complex questions and a world in which new automated and connected technologies and intelligent technologies are playing an increasing role in, in our lives and are opening up possible futures for us that humans will also be involved in as well. And I want to start the talk by showing you a short video clip. This is one of my favorite video clips. It's from a project that I collaborated on and I led, which was undertaken in Indonesia in collaboration with Unilever in the UK. I also collaborated with a filmmaker and an anthropologist and some other academics from other areas to make the film. This is one of the um, dissemination clips. One of the ways I work is I use incisive clips from my research to try to make key points. This is one of my favorite clips um, because I think it tells us something about technology that most anthropologists know, but which unfortunately is not a widespread belief. Yeah. 
So anthropologists, I hope all of us have known for many years, all of the research that's been done in anthropology since the, particularly since the 1980s, we've known for many years that people appropriate technologies and use them as they will to fulfill their own everyday needs. We also know that people improvise with technologies to achieve the ends that, that they need as well. One of the best moments in this research project was when I looked, I watched the video and, and I, I read from the translation that, um, that the participants had said, you know, that Nadia had asked them, why don't you use your washing machine to wash the clothes? Because the expectation of, of companies who design and make washing machines is that you probably would be washing the clothes in the washing machine. But they used the, what they called the drying cycle, which wasn't the drying cycle, but the translation told us that they were saying it was the drying cycle. It was the spin cycle. And they, were, they had many reasons for believing that it wasn't a good idea to wash your clothes in the washing machine. And those ideas unfolded through our, through our research project where we actually understood the culturally specific beliefs that actually tell you that your, your clothes do get damaged when you use a washing machine. It's best not to. It's best to use the washing machine for something else and not for washing the clothes. Now, for anthropologists, I, I think that that's a pretty obvious explanation. It makes so much sense to us. We know that people shape their uses of technology socially and culturally, and also in relation to the contingencies of their everyday lives. But what's still shocking to me, even though I know it's, it's a reality, is that dominant narratives in society continue to be led by the belief that technological solutions can actually solve societal problems and everyday life problems. And it seems really, when we consider the clip that I've shown and the understandings that anthropologists like myself and others have developed over years and years of work, we know that that's not the case. It seems really shocking that actually our society is structured by those kinds of beliefs and convictions. And it's precisely in the field of emerging technologies that some of those beliefs and convictions are the most worrying and most problematic. So in 2017, Scientific American's list of 10 emerging technologies to watch were described as being innovations that are on the verge of making a difference to society. So they would come and they would make the difference to society, which appears to be quite passive in this rendering. The MIT Technology Review claimed that its 10 breakthrough technologies in 2017 will affect the economy and our politics. They will improve medicine and they will influence our culture because our culture was there waiting to be influenced by these amazing new technologies. Such a relief. <laughs> and that's why we're worried about if self-driving cars are going to decide who to kill, because the societal narratives, which are so dominant in media, in some areas of industry, in government, in policy, in technology design, and in engineering, are telling us that emerging technologies are going to come along, they're going to impact on society, potentially do things that are quite worrying and problematic to us. But also, potentially, they're going to improve our lives as well. We'll come on to that a bit later. Um, Academics are also worried about this. Philosophers and ethicists also are, are making these, these points. We must not allow self-driving cars to be programmed to kill us. Other examples, there are many, many examples. This is one of the most recent ones that's been spoken about in, in the last weeks um, as well, China's dystopian social credit system, um, which again is a very, very worrying configuration and very worrying ideas and the implications of what could happen to us through these kinds of systems are very worrying. But it's another example of the, the way in which we were living in a world which has such complex problems, such complex problems relating to power, to inequality. Some of the things that were spoken about in some of the very first talks today, which demonstrate that you know, we, we need to somehow find ways to deal with those issues. But these issues are being represented in media in such a way that we understand new and emerging technologies as actually being able to do stuff to our world, which we need to stop. Um, so what's happening? As I was saying, you know, these dystopian narratives actually illuminate concerns about how the world's problems will shape uses of technology. The utop utopian narratives around them demonstrate that the hopes that technologies will solve the problems. So we've got these two different visions and versions of why, what might be going to happen. So why does the world need anthropologists? Either it's all going to go very wrong or it's going to go very right and technology will be the solution, but maybe it won't. Um, 
We're actually then now facing this new wave of, of technological automation, machine intelligence, artificial intelligence. And anthropologists have a role to play in this context. And in this context, it's believed then that some emerging technologies will impact on the world, improve society and our lives. Um, but there are also many uncertainties and anxieties about how to manage emerging technologies, and that's another reason why we need anthropologists. What's the role of anthropology? How can we actually help in this situation where emerging technologies are coming into a world of really problematic inequalities, social, economic, and power inequalities? What we need, I argue then, is an interventional design anthropology of emerging technologies. We're not, anthropology is not going to come and save us from a dystopia. It's not going to help policymakers, industry, to find, find ways to make people accept technologies and to use them properly. We saw in my first video clip, people aren't going to use technologies properly. So any idea that emerging technologies are going to come and save the world because people will use them as engineers, governments and industry expect them to, is not going to work either. So there's no point in us trying to help people to change their behaviour and do it properly. And anthropologists don't help to change people's behaviour anyway. Um, but what we can do is we can help to try to turn around the problem. We can ask how emerging technologies can be designed for human futures. And that's the key thing, is to understand our futures as not being technological futures that we're going to go and live in and participate in, but to understand human futures as being ongoing, unstoppable. Every moment that we live in, we're stepping out into our futures and our uncertain futures, but those futures are human as well as technological. We need to think about how our futures and technological futures can actually come together to open up the possibilities that technologies might offer us, but to do so in such a way that humans are engaged and involved in those processes. We need to actually create new opportunities to do well in a world of wicked problems. If we want to put it into the language that's often used to, to characterise problems that are actually so difficult to solve, that are almost interminable, which keep going on and on and on are enduring. The reason why those problems are wicked, the reason why they're enduring, is actually because we're not considering them through, a cons through human futures. We tend to look at technologies as offering solutions, and the solutions that technologies offer most usually only create new problems. We also need to do this in collaboration. Anthropologists can't do it on our own. We, we shouldn't even consider and think that, that the lone anthropologist has a mission to step in and save the world. Actually, we need to work in collaboration with our partners from industry, government, um, NGOs, with activists and with other organisations, whichever configuration we choose, and hopefully with all of those groups of people at the same time, that would be one of the best ways that anthropologists could in intervene in and helping to work towards an equitable and responsible and ethical future. So what kind of anthropology do we need? I thought it was interesting that we've had several kind of talks and discussions and renderings of what anthropology is thought to be, what anthropology might be, how it's considered outside anthropology. Um, I guess I have a bigger problem with actually how anthropology is considered within anthropology as well. I think we need a different anthropology that's not understood as it is by external views of anthropology or by mainstream internal understandings of anthropology as a field of scholarship and what anthropology has been. Um, I don't think that we need the kind of anthropology that is what anthropology has been. We need a futures anthropology, which is something I've been... Uh, identifying and developing with the Futures Anthropology Network of the European Association of Social Anthropologists. We need a design anthropology. We need a methodologically bold anthropology that will step out of the methods anthropologists have used, that will not just interview people and observe people, and the, an anthropology that will use film, that will use design techniques, that will try to use creative, other creative techniques and to imagine future scenarios in new ways. Um, we also need a collaborative anthropology, a corrective to the lone anthropologist of old academia. I was going to try and find some of those old black and white photos um, online and, and use those in my, my slide presentation of the anthropologist sitting alone by their tent, somewhere really beautiful and exotic. Um, but I didn't. Um, instead, I want to direct you to workshop number eight, creating continuous communication, which will be held by my colleagues who I collaborate with at Halmstad University in Sweden and Volvo Cars tomorrow. They will show you how it's done. Um, and here they are. Not all of them. You'll meet different people tomorrow. 
But um, this is actually what anthropo an anthropology of the future and present should look like. Um, this is most of the human experience and expectations of autonomous driving team. Um, and in the team, we have people who work with Volvo cars, people who are designers, user experience designers. We have ethnologists. Um, we have um, myself, an anthropologist. We have um, Baike Ford, who's a, a pedagogy and eth ethnographic scholar. Um, people from all different disciplines collaborating together. Um, this is also what it looks like. This is the natural user experience team that I collaborate with, with Samsung Institute in, in Brazil and the Federal University of Pernambuco. And here we have computer scientists, we have user experience designers from Samsung, and we have designers from the university in Brazil. Um, a whole interdisciplinary team. And look at the size of the teams. Um, this is only a small group within our team, actually. There, there are many of us. Um, and this is another team. This is a team that I worked with. Um, we were doing, working on a sound noise, motorway noise transformation project in Australia. And here we have sound artists, sound designers, acoustic engineers, and my ethnography team, which is made up of myself, an anthropologist, a designer, and a human geographer. So again, this is actually what I think um, an interventional design anthropology of emerging technologies should look like, where it should be. It should be located like this. So from the big picture then down to the specific, specific collaborations, I've just shown you pictures of what some of those look like in terms of who's involved. Now, anthropology is a critical discipline, um, and I think we need to maintain that. Um, we can identify the problems on a larger scale and the problems I've just been speaking about, but we also are needed in specific contexts. Anthropology has traded on for many years on our engagement with the specific, with the local, with what's actually happening on the ground, and our capacity to actually combine that with theoretical dialogue and theoretical engagement to thinking up, to thinking about the big questions and the big issues and how we can actually approach them from a more abstract <coughs> perspective. As the anthropologist Paul, Paul Stoller has written about tacking between the, the sensible and the intelligible, the movement between what we can feel and what we can know because we get onto the surface, we get into people's lives, how we can move that into other areas, whether that means working with an industry partner on specific problems they're interested in, or whether it means working on that bigger level of what's wrong with the world at all. Um, we need to do that collaboratively with people from other disciplines. Um, I'm going to quickly talk about the three groups that I mentioned I've introduced you to earlier and to tell you a little bit about how that can actually happen, what specific projects might look like. I'm not going to talk about research findings, this is not that kind of talk, but um, this is the human experiences and expectations of autonomous driving project that I've worked on with my colleagues in, in Sweden, um, which has been an amazing project in terms of how we've been able to collaborate across um, design technology design and ethnography. We've done ethnographic research with drivers of cars who've got some semi-autonomous features as they've driven with us and shown us around their homes as they've commuted across their, their cities in Stockholm and Gothenburg. We've learned some incredible things about how the car and the smartphone are already used together in ways that bring together automated and technologies that are quite different in new ways, which has enabled us to think theoretically about incomplete and hybrid technologies, but to think very practically about how people are already making their journeys automated and connected in their own improvisatory ways. Um, we've also done research in car testing sites. Catalin Oss, who's here, who I think is, is well known in the Why the World Need Anthropologist community, has been collaborating with colleagues at Volvo Cars to do ethnographic research with Wizard of Oz testing which has been a fantastically innovatively way, innovative way to work methodologically by bringing together um, design and technological research with ethnographic research within the same project. We've also been doing some really exciting research with Volvo's Drive Me project, which has launched semi-autonomous vehicles on the roads in, with families in, in Gothenburg. So the way that we've been able to collaborate with this particular industry and um, academic um, mode of working together has offered us as anthropologists marvellous ways of, of learning to work in new ways um, and also the opportunity to work with technologies we would, which technologies that enable us to understand what possible future experiences of technologies that aren't on the market yet would be like. Um, 
Working in Brazil with Samsung and the Federal University of Pernambuco, what we've been able to do there has been a fascinating project. And what was wonderful about our project there, Natural User Experience, is that we started off by doing a project that we thought was going to be about screenless futures, and which still has implications for that, but actually ended up being a project that told us something about road safety and the way that people use automated and connected technologies when they commute across massive Brazilian megacities which was completely new, which we hadn't been expected to expecting to find. And that's the wonderful thing about using design anth anthropology and industry projects, is that we're actually able to go under the surface and find out things which, as ethnographers, we weren't expecting to find, although we knew that we would find something that we weren't expecting to find, because you always find that when you do anthropology. But then bring those insights into an industry context and our collaboration with the users experience team in Samsung to actually think very differently about technologies and, and driving specifically in the Latin American context. And finally, the um, motorway noise transformation project. This is a project which was done by a team of academic researchers um, that's funded by Transurban in um, Australia, which is a company that's involved in motorways. And um, they were very interested in our research. And what we sought to do there was um, we then, we actually, in this project, we didn't start with the people, we started with the technologically possible. We, the um, sound design and sound art and acoustic engineering teams developed a series of noise transformations and noise, tran noise cancellations of motorway noise and then created next to a motorway um, this kind of booth um, where, in which they could be experienced. Our, our ethnography team worked with the local community to do ethnography before they were experienced to understand what the neighbourhood sounded like. It's right next to a motorway, so it was noisy. And then also to do ethnography specifically with, the, um, with people who came to experience the transformations. So again, it was a marvellous opportunity to work with designers of different kinds and engineers and artists to develop an understanding of actually what possibilities their technologies created for people to have novel and relaxing and, and um, pleasurable experiences of motorway noise once it had been transformed. This project, I think, also has fascinating implications for how we can think about noise and city data and, and future smart cities, which I will take on in, in my thinking with my colleagues into other work that we would hope to do later. So what are emerging technologies? I'll go back to the definitions that I started with. Technolo um, emerging technologies, um, we've been told, are innovations that are on the verge of making a difference to society. They will affect the economy, our politics, and improve medicine or influence our culture. So technological innovations there are imagined by engineers, scientists, governments, and industry to be able to solve contemporary problems. Is that it? Or are they unfinished and inevitably incomplete technologies that if they reach markets, and that's if, they might reach markets and not stay there for very long. Um, they will not provide solutions. They will create possibilities that people will complete, that people will improvise with, that people will appropriate, and that people will work with to create human futures. The successful new technologies, the successful products that go to market but will be these ones, products and, that people can take with them as they step on into their own futures. Those are the ones w which will be able to endure, the ones that people will be able to do things with. And how can we rethink how people do things with technologies as they move on to their futures? I knew there was something else I had to say. <laughs> so it's here, I think, that we need to work towards opening up these possibilities. That's where the world needs anthropology. What kind of anthropology does does the world need? It needs an interdisciplinary and interventional anthropology of emerging technologies. That's what I hope I've shown you can be possible. It needs it to be rooted in ethnography. It needs it to happen in dialogue with theory. And that's what makes us different from research agencies that do ethnography. It needs to be methodologically experimental. In the projects that I've talked about, we've disseminated our findings through films, through, through short clips, through video art, through design cards, and through workshops, and through any ways that we can engage with people who are, who are interested. We don't want to just do what's been done before. It's essentially collaborative, and that means it will get moulded into other things as it moves on, and it will be different in every different configuration, every different project. 
but it also needs to have an agenda, this agenda to critique the assumption that emerging technologies would change the world if only people would trust and accept them. So there's a bigger picture as well. It goes right from what we believe we think we should change in terms of societal thinking down to the detail of going into people's real everyday lives and thinking about what matters for those particular people in that particular place, in that particular moment. Thank you very much.